The skulls and artifacts in this video are authentic from sites all around the globe. Feel free to share, but please do not download and respect the copyrights herein. Viewer discretion advised. So tell me straight, Rabbi, have any powerful people attempted to bury this knowledge? I tried to figure out where was the disconnect in history. This video is about the Nephilim, a mystery that goes back even further than Babylon. Enjoy the ride. Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward.
place is not random. In fact, they're 10 to the negative 33 centimeters. The fabric of reality is finite. Almost like a pure data live stream, and it's not random. That's extremely powerful knowledge. It was Albert Einstein who once said, reality is merely an illusion. When you hear the physics guys talking about the universe as a hologram, or saying that our reality is a simplified projection of a much more complex reality, or saying that time, space, and matter are synthetic. I don't know if I like the term projection. It seems far too limiting. Or mathematicians who might say that the whole place appears to be a product of mathematics, which our mathematics are extremely inadequate to describe. It is true that a created thing can never understand the full scope of who created it. Bottom line that this place is couched in a much larger spiritual and dimensional reality. These are the words of Paul when writing to the Hebrews, do not forget to entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels unaware. How can a spiritual being, an angel, or even a whole set of fallen angels, give actual birth to its own genetic line of anomalies? How can something spiritual, dimensional, interact with something physical. I'm not sure that the lines are quite that black and white. It was Jude, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Mind you, this comes right before Jude quotes from Enoch 1.9. Enoch would be the seventh from Adam, the great-grandfather of Noah in the book of Genesis. Genesis 5.24 And Enoch was not, for God took him. God really liked Enoch. And so Jude is saying, Even the angels, which kept not their first estate, angels there is talking about fallen angels. The term kept not their first estate has a dual meaning in that sentence. Not just that they left the heavens, but their physical bodies for earthly flesh and material bodies. Jude continues, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. These are actual fragments from the book of Enoch found in the caves of Qumran in Israel, dating anywhere between 100 to 400 BC. And of course, the most famous document and record to come out of those caves was this actual image of a scroll of Isaiah found in those caves, which had scholars literally holding their breath until they found out that every single word has an exact precision matching our current text that is uncanny. This applies to all of the Hebrew texts, by the way, even the Greek Jewish texts. The fragments from the book of Enoch matched up perfectly with copies found by explorer James Bruce in complete Ethiopian Bibles in 1773. The book of Enoch is divided into five sections. It's in the Book of the Watchers, where the bulk of the Qumran fragments come from, that Enoch is telling you that a set of 200 fallen angels made physical entrance to this place. This would have been prior to the flood of Noah, as Enoch 
was the great grandfather of Noah. In fact, this would have been more than a thousand years before Noah, as Methuselah, the longest living man ever recorded in the biblical text, lived 969 years. If you do the math on it, Methuselah actually died the very year or seven days before the flood. Curiously, the name Methuselah means his death shall bring or perhaps more precisely, his death shall bring the judgment. Speaking of strange skulls, skulls like this one here are what the archaeological community often refer to as Neanderthal skulls, like this actual image of a Neanderthal skull on the screen here. Now there are all sorts of variations, shapes, and sizes of monkey bones on the planet Earth. Monkeys and humans are grandly different in their bone structures. This is a human skeleton and this is a set of monkey bones like this actual bone structure of a gorilla on the screen right here. Out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands if not millions of both human bones and monkey bones such as the infamous skeletal structure of the small monkey Lucy, seen on the screen here, on the entire face of the whole planet Earth. There are exactly zero mixtures of half human, half monkey, or monkeys becoming humans. Or the more commonly used terminology, there are no missing links. This doesn't come as terribly surprising to me because genetically speaking, within the DNA of any living, breathing organism, animals are restricted within their animal kinds. They have certain body plans. For example, horses can breed other variations of horses within their body plans. Same thing with dogs. They can have subtypes underneath that body plan and variations, but dogs cannot breed rabbits or horses. Taking the genetics one step further, every living organism, its digital software coding, its actual DNA, is losing coding over time it's weakening, deteriorating. It's not just animal species that we are systematically and slowly losing, not gaining in the order of a thousand to ten thousand different creatures annually, depending on whose numbers that you listen to, but we're certainly losing things as opposed to gaining them. And following suit with that, the DNA, the actual digital software of life itself for every type of creature is also weakening with every generation. The same as would happen as if you make a copy of 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 anything, you're going to see it weaken, not strengthen. A Neanderthal skeleton and skull is absolutely identical to a modern human, except for a few key features. The bones are thicker, stronger, more fit, also, the wisdom teeth down here fit absolutely perfectly. These thick brows can vary in size from skull to skull. A small detail that a lot of people may not know. The human brow of any individual, this bone right up here, continues to grow just ever so slightly through the entirety of a person's life. You may see on an old man's brow, he's got a very defined brow. So if you were to live two or three or four or five hundred years, then that much larger brow that you see indenting up right there is precisely how your skull would look.
When we peer back in history to our oldest written texts, we're finding redundant accounts of very long lifespans. In the biblical texts, most absolutely and definitely in the Sumerian kings list, as well as records covering what amounts to little more than settlements following the great flood, as is recorded here in the Epic of Gilgamesh, along with the extended lifespans, both before and briefly after the flood. This is the oldest written epic in the entire world. The actual records of King Gilgamesh of Uruk, one of the first kings following the Great Flood. These Neanderthal skulls have varying sizes of large brows. In short, what you're looking at with these Neanderthal skulls is eerily identical to what a human being would look like if they were much more fit than we are today and had lived varying amounts of hundreds and hundreds of years. From a genetic perspective, no one actually knows what causes death or initiates the death process capping us out in anywhere between 100 and 120 years. Almost as if someone flicked a switch off inside the coating. Every single cell in your entire body is programmed to regenerate and renew itself. But when dealing with the topic of the Nephilim, we are by no means talking about elongated years and larger brows, stronger bodies and wisdom teeth that fit perfect like a glove. The extremely long years resting on the large brow of the forehead. Nor are we fiddling around with old monkey bones. The truth, however, is that there are a lot of human-esque bones on this planet which can very easily, even to trained experts, blur the lines between was it human or was it something else? Now there are a lot of tribes that have done varieties of things, their bodies to achieve a number of different effects including the binding of the skull to produce this elongated shape on the back of the head. There are some significant differences, however, between even the best of clearly modified skulls, like this skull on the screen here, and skulls that appear significantly larger and much more naturally formed than that. Like this actual elongated skull being compared against the bust of either Nefertiti or Akhenaten's daughter. Leading many to ask if these tribesmen originally began binding babies' heads in an attempt to copy something that was perhaps a whole lot larger in scope, like this actual skull found in Peru. Some of these are just absolutely massive. And there are hundreds and hundreds of them. Wildly massive, including children that already have the features. One of the first red flags that you're dealing with something that is incredibly strange is that the actual head volume of the elongated skull is at least 25% larger in its head volume than a regular human or even an old human skull. These are in fact quite different. But it's not just that they absolutely have to be enormously massive. There's another difference on just the skulls themselves which is even more puzzling than that. Every human skull on every single human being should have these two plates in the back of the skull. 
that are clearly divided between the two of them by this crease running towards the back of the head. This elongated skull, however, is not like that with the crease and the two plates in the back. This skull has one long crease, very defined here, a crease coming back this way, and one very large skull cap. Binding a little baby's head should most certainly not change the genetic bone structure. But it's not just elongated heads we're talking about. We're also talking about giants like this Thailand image holding the enormous sword and the two fangs or tusks coming out of the mouth. Now I do believe that's a Babylonian Ishtar right there depicted as a circular disc which these three gentlemen are bringing before this very large character. Babylon, particularly ancient Babylon, plays perhaps a critical role in all this. Just second down from Babylon would be Egypt. After the Hebrews were in the wilderness during the time of the tabernacle and about to enter the promised land in Numbers 13.33 it says this, and there we saw the giants, the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who were of the giants and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers before them. Now there are some tribes where God told the Hebrews just conquer the people and then there are other tribes where God specified wipe them all out as if there's some type of a gene pool problem as is in the case of the Canaanites, the Raphites, the Ammonites, all of which are listed as giants. And then you've got other types of tribes, like for example, the Amalekites. The first part of Amalekite means people. The second part of the Amalekite, it's an ancient word in, in Semitic languages that means vampire-like demon. These Amalekites were not human. And a lot of people believe that this is where the vampire legends came from in Romania. And I'm, I'm sure um, the Israelites well knew this by looking at them. I mean, if, if, the, if the Malachites are considered a vampire-like demon, you know, I'm sure they probably have the features. Deuteronomy 311, only King Og of Bashan, the giant, was left remaining of the Raphites, the Ammonites, or so the Hebrews believed. But the truth is giants have been reported in archaeological finds all across the globe, particularly in the United States, which is what most every one of these news articles right here going down the screen are about many of them from the New York Times. Some bones are still available, however, like this actual image of a jawbone recovered from a giant skeleton in Nevada that's being compared to a human jawbone on the screen. How large do you think that skeleton actually was? or the Indian legend of the red-headed giants. Interesting about Indian legends, the symbol of the how is often said to ensure that the other guy does not have six fingers. Or the famous serpent mounds in Ohio where in the 1800s it's reported that skeletons of enormous giants were found around this site that has the shape of an enormous serpent that they mysteriously built, which can only truly be seen well 
from the air. Following the 1950s and the defeat of Nazi Germany and eugenics, same time period that Americans began pumping out movies about space invaders and men coming from other planets, and deeply religious views of the occult such as those of Blavatsky, instrumental in the occult beliefs of Adolf Hitler himself, sort of take a sidestep into the shadows. Articles such as these begin to dry up and disappear in roughly about the 1950s. And the skeletons seem to vanish. Many make the strong case that the bone structures disagree with the political formulation of the theory of evolution. Whereas that may be true, there are others who would argue that it's somewhat deeper than that. Speaking of a cult, if I shift my attention over in the direction of ancient Egypt, the place that occasionally had kings with very unusual skulls, like this actual imagery here, done using the skull of King Akhenaten. Here's the skull of the 18th Dynasty King Akhenaten without any digital effects on it. This piece of artwork is female believed by many to be Akhenaten's daughter. Here is his son, the child king, in this x-ray on the screen here. The very infamous King Tut, who also had this rather... This family had very unique features, long head, in all of the drawings of himself, like this actual drawing of Achenhotten. Notice the crown is very elongated and the strange shape of the body. And this is the wife, Nefertiti, carved in stone. This king moved the most powerful palace in all of Egypt to rule over an area called Amarna to take the pentacle of power and throne of the empire from Thebes and Abydos and the land of the old gods all the way up here to a newly prospering place called Amarna which is directly across the Red Sea from Sinai. Curious thing about the ruins of this particular dig site it has a reported 365 outdoor altars, the practice of worship of one God, a mesmerizing place stretching into the horizon, and it's an entirely well-drawn community, all three of which are not Egyptian practices, they're Hebrew practices. One thing that Akhenaten and his son, King Tut, both proved is that even God kings can die. Both were killed with remarkably similar bashes in their long heads. I personally think that the visor eye did it in cahoots with the head military general Ramses, great grandfather of Ramses the Great. But I wasn't there and the statute of limitations has run out. Akhenaten, shown here with the serpent coming out of his forehead, and his son, Tut, were the final kings of the 18th dynasty, later giving rise to the 19th dynasty king, Ramses the Great, immortalized in this statue here who many believe was the Pharaoh at the time of the Exodus. Mern Ptah, depicted here standing next to Ra with the disc encapsulated by the serpent. Mern Ptah was the next king to take the throne of Egypt after Ramses. 
He was also the 13th son of Ramses the Great. On his victory steel, depicted right here, makes a strange statement. The people of Israel is laid waste. Their crops are not. I have no idea what that means. Just because your dad, Ramses, hands you an empire, missing at least half of its army and all of its slaves, you can't go getting all bent out of shape about that. But if I am to hop way backwards in time, that 200 fallen angels recorded as having come in prior to the flood, which is really what's being referred to when you hear terms like mystery religion. Notice the star inside of the golden jewel-covered crescent. Covered in the book of Enoch, alluded to in the book of Genesis, as well as many parts of both the Old and New Testament, as well as ancient texts and hieroglyphs that we'll look at and writings all across the ancient world being recorded in large scale prior to the flood and then in a smaller trickle of a scale following the flood. There are at least 277 flood stories from cultures stretching every conceivable part of the globe. Some of them bringing you right to the front doorstep of that flood, like the Epic of Gilgamesh from 2700 to 2900 BC. Every mountain range on Earth contains fish fossils, marine life, and even seashells found on top of Mount Everest in the Himalayas. Extending to include mass beached whale graveyards, turning up in the middle of deserts, like this classic example here of the mass whale graveyard in Chile, the most arid desert in the world. And here's another whale dig site from the other side of the globe in the sands of Egypt. Look at the size of that whale buried in that desert there. Plant and animals are found buried and fossilized in every single layer and strata of the top layers of the earth. Creatures of every possible kind of animal that we see every day are found mixed in underneath the earth along with mammoth sized creatures which don't seem to be around anymore. And these animals of every genre and flavor are often found in mass graveyards like this actual dinosaur graveyard seen on the screen here as if the animals were herding and whatever happened, happened fast, hit all at once and was unexpected. Strangely, when dealing with strata, it is sifted by sediments exactly as one would expect. If there were a lot of water pumping around on the surface of the ground. One of the enormous challenges of dating anything is that you have to know what the pre-existing conditions were. For example, this dragonfly fossilized on the screen here has a two and a half foot long wingspan. Dragonflies take in perfectly the amount of oxygen that they need to fly. If one were to assume that atmospheric conditions, oxygen levels and carbon levels in the past were like this, when they were actually way up here like this, that would indeed pump out numbers that were very large all across the board. This dragonfly on the screen could not lift up off the ground and fly today. We find extremely high oxygen levels in little bitty air bubbles trapped in ancient tree sap, even buried in common things that we might not think about, 
Look at the size of this modern day elephant in comparison to this giant animal here, a bronchiosaurus. Much of this stuff requires an entirely different and much more lush environment. This elephant is about the size in girth as the base of the neck of this animal. A bronchiosaurus would have a terribly difficult time lifting its body today. And that is but one tiny example of an Everest-sized mountain of thousands. The most common method of dating in this present day is using fossils to date geological layers and using geological layers to date fossils. So some would call this circular reasoning. One thing that I find fascinating, not only are there mass burials of animals underground, but there are mass burials of trees going all sorts of different directions. Some of them, interestingly enough, going vertical. What this means is that you would have trees that would have had to have been standing up for millions of years while the layers of strata form around the tree. No one really knows how many of these there actually are buried all over the place underneath the ground. This is believed to be the oldest living tree on earth. Its name is Methuselah and its age is believed to be 4,840 years old, give or take. Which is interesting because if you're using the Septuagint or the Masoretic text and even using Gilgamesh as well as the Sumerian Kings list as a reference point, you're going to come up with a flood date, a pinch more than 3000 BC, maybe a few hundred years more. And old Methuselah would have been born just a little bit afterwards. I wasn't there, but I know this that enormous whales really should not be turning up in deserts and thousands and thousands and thousands of seashells should not be backpacking through the Himalayas. Trees don't generally stand up for tens or hundreds or millions of years while layers of sediments build up around them. I'm thinking that maybe uh, Real big flood, did it? Occasionally I'll hear commentators state that ancient India is tens and tens, sometimes even hundreds of thousands of years old. And I've tried to chase the rabbit trails on what they mean by that. It's not just India, you'll find this pulling dates out of thin blue sky particularly in media stuff, a lot. I can't find what they're referencing. The empire of India began following the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC. You begin to see the rise of the first empire of India, the Muryan dynasty. Going back even further, into the Far East, the rise of the first dynasty of ancient China, the Jia dynasty, its inception at 2000 BC, bringing us full circle to our first empires, which would rise right down here in Mesopotamia, where Babylon would become in the ancient city of ancient Uruk where Gilgamesh ruled. Land of the star, which is rested inside of the crescent. Babylon and Egypt, the two opening players of occult empires right after the flood. And then dropping down right over here, following alongside the Nile River banks where Egypt 
would become and where step pyramids and the first attempts at actual pyramids would begin to rise. Under Dejoser in the third dynasty of Egypt about 2600 BC. Land of the Eye of Horus and disc between the horns of the most ancient Hathor. Both stretches of land dropping down along the fertile land. The so-called cradle of civilization where little bitty settlements would begin to take shape with your first tiny fortified cities like Uruk in roughly 2900 to 3000 BC. Coincidentally, both newly developing locations dropping down from right up here in the same area where the boat that saved all mankind is said to have landed. So those 200 angels covered by Enoch prior to the flood does not represent all of the fallen angels that there are. It represents a small portion of the total number of fallen angels, the ones which made entrance to this place, came in and interbred with human beings. This created all sorts of little uglies and unfriendlies, including the giants. There's also indications in the text that this wasn't necessarily voluntary. What some of your oldest pages and little bitty scribbles on earth, including Enoch, in full detail are telling you is that before that flood, something unfriendly made entrance to this place and was genetically breeding itself, creating its own offspring, turning mankind into a blood-bathed circus of its own unimaginable and twisted design, spreading like a virus generation after generation after generation for more than a thousand years until the flood came along, wiping the slate clean, taking everything back down to zero. But then afterwards, another little bitty door opened. And perhaps what was in the past might slowly creep its way back in for a final show. It's my extremely strong opinion that the bulk of the hundreds of truly strange bones and enormous skulls unlike man in this video came after the ancient flood. Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. Genesis 6, 4. Breeding generations. Look at the scope of the size of this child's head. And then breeding even more generations. The size of the eye sockets are enormous. Moving up this large skull. And then dropping down to breed some more generations. And here's another little baby one. And then breeding even more than that. And look at the eye sockets in comparison to the size of the skull atop that tiny skeleton. Enoch 7-3 And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and began to devour mankind. It really is absolutely astounding. It's almost impossible to believe that what you're looking at 
really is real. This one commonly gets called the Royal Redhead. A special thank you to Brian Forrester. As well as his team in Paracas, Peru for making the footage as well as the elongated skulls seen in this video available. That is one strange head. Enoch continues and they begin to sin against the birds and the beasts and the reptiles and the fish. I have absolutely no idea exactly what that means. But it doesn't sound good. And to devour one another's flesh and drink the very blood. It is curious that whether in a biological or a spiritual sense that is equally as deep, if not deeper, than even the mysterious thing that we call consciousness, which seems in a very real way to plug us in to reality at all. There's always something uniquely special about the blood. There's a, there's, it is an interesting verse that we've all heard in Leviticus 17, 14. You've heard it a million times. The life of all flesh is in the blood. The real word is actually saying the rock of every sort of flesh is in the blood. It's saying the spirit of the flesh is in its blood, not the life. That is being not a poor translation, but a mistranslation. It is important to note that after death, the blood is no longer usable. As if it's lost something. Every living organism on this planet is constructed of three-dimensional digital coding. Like zip files, pure data, zero junk code in every single strand. Tip for tat, line for line, which opens up click by click by click to become a living biological organism. All of it fitting together like a perfect glove. And deeper inside the genome, the framework of pure biological software and precision operating system. File folders containing actual body plans, digital instructions, coordinating every strand, every cell, every little bitty part, pulling the molecular fabric of every piece together to create a biological masterpiece, literally written, birthed into reality itself from scratch and seemingly plugged in to neurologically and consciously control every single system of the entire biological masterpiece. It's not just consciousness, the intangible controlling the tangible, which is a paradox. The living blueprint for what you call you is alive in every single drop of your blood. One could quite easily come to believe that there's something a lot larger in scope going on here. It does say in Genesis 1.26 that God himself created mankind in his own image and likeness. It's a powerful statement. When you're dealing with the ancient past or things which may even boggle the minds of trained physicians, let no detail no matter how seemingly trite, slip through the fingertips to truly understand Babylon and the time periods lasting to this modern age. 
the more recent past from which these skulls likely come. One could easily make an extremely strong case that we are merely infants running loose in very short-term little bodies, biological machines, through which we peer out consciously into this thing that we call the material world built and constructed right out of thin air by digital coding light years more sophisticated in each and every single strand than all of the computer software made by man combined all the way back to the very first computer what the pages of Enoch are saying as well as the Hebrew texts and cultures all across this globe is that something has tried to plug itself in and insert itself into all of that. Enoch is not just talking about a set of very dark fallen beings and producing their own hybrid children. It goes a lot deeper than that. What he's telling you is that these fallen angels which produced the Nephilim, neither completely angel or completely human, but something in between. So what he's, what he's literally saying is when they die, their, their souls come out from the race of giants that came from this union, gave way to a brood of evil spirits. And, it's, and those are the foul spirits of the earth, the demons. The Nephilim die, they become or get added to the number of demons. Beings which later cultures would call the underworld gods, the shadow creatures from all of the ages of history. Things and creatures that can possibly bleed through from a realm that might be just as close as the air between your fingertips. Now it is always eggs and semen that things like this are after, right? Or be summonsed. Notice the little baby down there in the image. There's a big part of me that thinks that that thing there might not ultimately want to be friends. Almost like whatever it is, it's close enough it can see you. Enoch used the term the watchers but in terms of evil the deeper darker more twisted and macabre the better and the higher the place of the carnage these aren't fallen angels if you cast them out the fallen angels can go they can go to the high places but these aren't fallen angels these are these are demons these are Raphaim. these are dead in the film don't forget that i brought up the high places Sure is a lot of red way up there in this drawing. The more vicious and brutal, the more bloody, yet venomous, terrifying and precise. The ceremony as if intoxicating things that dwell in the darkness. One of the most respected names in the field of ufology, his opinion shared by notable others such as J. Allen Hynek, was none other than Dr. Jacques Vallée, instrumental in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, commonly stated his belief that the UFO phenomenon was in fact demonic. Human beings are under the control of a strange force that bends them in absurd ways forcing them to play a role in a bizarre game of deception. It was Aleister Crowley, a self-proclaimed black magician at the top of a great many of the most predominant secret societies, to give the first drawing during the 20th century of one of these large-headed entities, a character that Crowley claimed stepped through into physical reality. This entity would ultimately become what Crowley would describe as a spiritual guide to him after an extensive battery of very intense 
black magic rituals. You may find some similarities between Crowley's drawing and thousands, if not tens of thousands, of other such entities drawn by people from every walk of life all around the globe. Crowley is quoted as stating, today they call them angels and demons. Tomorrow, they'll call them something else. The UFO phenomenon simply does not behave like extraterrestrial visitors. It actually molds itself in order to fit a given culture. John Ankerberg, John D, the head intelligence officer under Queen Elizabeth in the 1500s. He would do the deepest of inner layer occult rituals, popularizing such ideas as the crystal ball, alchemy, and the philosopher's stone. These long hours of ritual occult on behalf of the Empire of England were done with fellow black magician Edward Kelly. Kelly would ultimately leap to his death from a castle tower window. John Dee, however, would go on to catalog extensive lists, meticulously detailing out a vast array of entities, which he claimed not only could communicate, but could also physically step right through into the material world itself. Though the public position and statement of the Empire was that D was communicating with angels, D's diary discovered following his death told a different story, recording that the entities were becoming more and more evil. Notice the serpents stating more and more emphatically, these things are lying to me. They're not angels. They're demons. UFO knots and the demons of past days are probably identical. Dr. Pierre Gurin, in looking at accounts of claimed aliens, all roads seem to lead to the occult. More specifically, either Egyptian or Babylonian. Ephesians 6.12 for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, the claimed mystery religions themselves, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. Whether you're talking about something that just appears in the skies, spiritual wickedness in high places, which really does beg the question, where is it when you don't see it? One theory which can no longer be taken very seriously is that UFOs are interstellar spaceships with Sir Arthur C. Clarke or physically step through into this reality. Your ancient texts are taking you at least 10 steps further down the rabbit hole than that. I have yet to meet one person who has come out of the occult that does not have, in some cases, terrifying and extremely tangible and real accounts to give. I also find it particularly interesting when I've gotten to sit down with people who have had life after death experiences. Most especially if they were legally dead for any number of minutes and have actual medical records. Hell or ancient Sheol, whether it be from someone in the occult or someone from an after death experience, some strikingly eerie similarities. These bland, sort of expressionless, pull you in type characters with sort of varying degrees of sinister evilness, described almost like a diminished alternate version of Earth that the person steps as if the ground level is being described as lower or different or falls right inside of with things that literally grab hold and herd the people into actual pit-like cages wherein at that point the descriptions of the creatures get even worse. Things much more disturbing and twisted 
than what may channel in to be portrayed as physical artwork and representations of something through the imaginations in the minds of men. Ephesians 2.2 In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. What fascinates me is when people look up and they describe and the ruler of the kingdom of the air like these sky city type of apparatuses this spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience sort of hover in a murky or black dark scarred horizon whether in personal accounts or even in Enoch you get these hints of things that are in the air and things that are that are moving but diving below where the people are quickly snatched and drugged to the side by the apparent welcoming teams they'll talk about a lot of serpents ranging from enormous creatures to these more or less human sized things often with man-like or human-like features, similar to the wisdom serpents or serpent gods found in every single major ancient culture with uncanny similarities. Look at that big old serpent crawling inside of the crescent-shaped moon between the two Babylonian Ishtar stars. I do believe you're gonna find the serpents like the one these three fine fellows are praying to in nearly every belief and religion on earth. The serpents, no matter what size or shape they're described as, just like any of the other characters within the place, always had this ancient old one, yet vicious and precise kind of highly intelligent twist. It's also noteworthy to point out the similarities historically of bones or warped protrusion like horns. This is in this recreation of Egyptian artwork. Notice the extra set of horns on top is empty whereas in this rendering between the horns you've got this little disc resting on top. An environment described at the core of its beating heart, decrepit almost with this vibe of mechanical madness combined with living dead organism of tentacles and fangs. What some might have been calling the second heaven, the said diminished realm well beneath heaven, and decrepit much more than the earth, littered with sophisticated type things in its skies where the fallen angel Lucifer himself is said to rule for a short span. Almost like hitting the show code key for the virus side of reality and cavernous needing a breath and a drop of water flames. Probably the most terrifying part of all of it is that the things there wanted you there in their clutches for some reason. It's a prison that collects things that no one will ever come to help. I'm not going to physically or personally go in to check any of that out. I'm willing to take other people's word for it. Was Jesus Christ who described heaven as a place full of many mansions and likened hell to this actual place here, Gehenna, outside of Jerusalem, where the trash was burned. He was giving this analogy to common men, to sheep herders, couched in a way that they could understand it. As if the human body itself is Nothing more than a shell, a vessel, a confining temporal instrument 
binding one to a specific location in both time and space. Of those who have tried to describe heaven, though there are so many, from every possible age range, background, and culture, Enoch's pre-flood account is extremely precise. People commonly talk about this unusual event called the rapture in the Bible. There are technically seven of them by my count. Enoch is the first one on that list and he is the seventh from Adam. Wonder if that has a meaning. He stumbles for words at least a dozen times in his document stating to you I wish I could describe what I'm looking at and then afterwards talking about this place as if it doesn't even feel real anymore. Now to understand these things called Nephilim or the origins of physical evil it's important to recognize the entire scope but perhaps before taking a critical look at that pre-flood world of Genesis or the kings with enormous lifespans before the worldwide flood in the Sumerian kings list or analyzing the pages of Enoch great-grandfather of Noah I want you to notice the Greek Titan creatures part God part man in this image with his arms like a crescent holding the large disc in the middle same as what Gilgamesh claimed he was in the epic of Gilgamesh the oldest written epic on the face of the planet Earth the Titans the sons of Saturn or sons of Satan and this isn't just Babylon or ancient Samaria the place of the Anunnaki the biblical sons of Anak kings and rulers of ages past reaching out their hands to summons the deepest regions of darkness in an effort to beckon things that bite the very hand that feeds into this place the sacrifice of little children deeply seated derangement shedding of innocent blood to Moloch or Baal working darkness into a frenzy playing the drums louder to drown out the screams almost like a virus reaching out to grab its own desires through an extremely naive host to mass ritualistic human sacrifice notice up here above that the serpent is waiting it's almost as if the idea is that they're feeding something that the moment his eyes roll closed that there's something on the other side waiting for him to come through. Notice how the serpent is used as encapsulation, as if to define ownership. It says something really fascinating in Genesis 3.15, right after the eating of the fruit and the serpent in the garden. It says, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, the serpent is coming out from the forehead the place where the third eye or the mind's eye would be placed the eye of Horus or the all-seeing eye floating mysteriously above the pyramid of bricks built by men as a side note it is curious how strikingly similar the eye of Horus looks in comparison to a human penal gland inside the brain and dimensionally peering into this world through the glass darkly and of course the Inca with the symbol of this little bitty owl sort of peering through and between your offspring the seed of the serpent and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now take a good look at these symbols that look like little horns with a circle inside them on top of the head of these two serpents. 
Here's an enormous version of the same symbol. You're going to find quite a lot of these in ancient Egypt. Perhaps quite often on the head of an Egyptian goddess. And there's the little serpent. But it doesn't always have to be represented like that. For example, this golden cow's head here. See here even the cow's got a little serpent with the two ears or horns that makes sort of a cradle. Stars always representing angels inside of it with the sun shining light out from behind the ears inside of the cradle. But the sun also sort of looks like it makes an eye-shaped appearance going around it or a crescent moon with a star. Now when you're talking about stars like this large representation of a Babylonian Ishtar sitting couched inside of its crescent, the stars when used in ancient texts are extremely often symbolism for angels or perhaps even a very particular fallen angel. The answer goes all the way back to the Temple of Hathor, to the mega complex of Dendera. Hathor goes all the way back to King Narmer himself in Dynasty Zero. That's King Narmer right there from the Narmer palette found in the Temple of Horus. Notice up here the long crown on the head of the king. And at the top of the palette of the first king of Egypt, the first symbol of the face of Hathor. A literal temple for storing the history all the way back to the inception of ancient Egypt itself with the symbol of Hathor crowned atop the serpent's heads. The Egyptians believed that the kingship of all Egypt started with one named Osiris, a dead man who would be brought back to life by Isis. Osiris would be infilled and reanimated by the spirit of an underworld god. Notice the wings on the goddess. And then up over here, the little horns with the disc in the center. The flesh of the reanimated Osiris is generally a murky bluish green. This union of a resurrected dead man and a winged creature would give birth to what they called Horus. Notice the disc in this image no longer is encapsulated with horns but instead is simply wrapped with a serpent. This shape is not two horns. It's the shape of a woman's womb which is why it's on the head of a fertility goddess. And the solar disk or sun disk in the center is just like the star was for the Babylonians. And the sun in their hieroglyphs is owned by the serpent, the symbol for the ruler of the air. Inside the crescent, the birth canal or the moon being represented in the feminine in which the sun symbolically has rested inside of and producing Horus, the new little eye that is peering through and watching. Notice down here the serpent again with the little disc on its head. In fact, at the entrance to the Temple of Hathor, where this enormous symbol is, there are actually 17 little bitty serpents underneath that humongous symbol. It's like a little identifier. This plus this equals this. It's like a post-it note for the ancient beast.
popped right on top of their heads. Move out of the way, we're making underworld gods here. All right, they're a bunch of demons. And of course, serpents in every possible and spiritual sense. Whatever may have been the exact details of what the Egyptians were trying so dearly to express. The underworld gods are not being displayed as just basic common day-to-day -day knowledge on their walls, but more than that, the focal point of the entire empire. It was an oppressive place. Here's a character from the walls of Egypt that you may recognize, or perhaps you're more familiar with his updated version. The star in the middle of the two horns. Even got two serpents down here coming out. The goat of Mendez. This text is from the Egyptians' most treasured document, the Book of the Dead, chapter 175, where Autumn, who would later combine with Autumn Ra, here enlisted as the High Supreme God, states this. Then I will be what will remain, just I and Asur, when I will have changed myself back into the old serpent who knew no man and saw no God. The pain, poverty, and hardship of common people does seem to follow that star. Cambodia, you have the Naga serpent kings. In Hindu, Vishna sleeps in the cosmos, Nirvana, with the serpents. Perhaps King Solomon was right. There's nothing new under the sun. Most all ancient cultures, particularly Babylon and ancient Egypt, believed that their gods, which could be physically summoned to manifest, were in the underworld. When you hear Luciferians and the cultists throughout every age talking about the ability to summon little spookies, things that most certainly do not have your best interest at heart or entities, very tangible things. Not only does it hate you, it wishes that it could be you. It's my extremely strong opinion that they are not making that up. This was believed to be a dimension running parallel side by side with the earth and equally as real a place full of hate anger bondage terror total lack and despair a place where mankind is herded up and cast to the fangs of a vast array of frightening things but in the very halls of pentacles of power throughout the ages of earth Men from nearly every age of empire, both great to small, in pursuit of mankind's age-old hang-ups, lust, greed, power, or the really big one that goes all the way back to the serpent and the garden itself, ye shall become as gods. Softly whispered lies, almost like the whole thing is a test. Trinkets in exchange for everything. Now if we go back just a pinch before the first step pyramid in Egypt under Dejoser, and I hop back over here to the land of Ur, Samaria, later Babylon, to the little tiny settlement of Uruk, called by many the oldest city in the world, and by some the rising New York City of the ancient world. It's just outside ancient Uruk, where Nimrod, the first king, the one recorded as having been in defiance 
to the Lord God. One of the great, great grandsons of Noah, drawn here deified in this 4,000 year old recreation of an artifact and artwork from ancient Nineveh. Or in the Sumerian writings, the legend of Enmerker, the king of Uruk, who actually built the great tower that has come to be known in history as the Tower of Babel. The name meant Gate of the God. You can view the Tower of Babel like one enormous mega invocation ritual. They're recorded as inviting something from the darkness to step up from its lair. It was at that point that they described something sort of human-like entered. 2 Corinthians 11.14 Even Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. The Sumerians called it the Inky as seen on this actual inscription. He's making entrance through this little doorway with these lines around it, surrounded by these two characters with heads that look something like this. And the Inky was called the Lord of Earth, the giver of knowledge or the morning star. Sometimes the word Abzu or the symbolism like these little wiggly lines here gets translated as waters. It's not quite correct. The word Abzu means abyss which is where the Inky being summoned here is coming forth out of. This stretching scape of land right here is believed to be the remains and ruins of the Tower of Babel. The place where in either the Sumerian texts or the biblical texts the tongues were confused and the people began to fan out or the ancient ziggurat of Eridu just 12 kilometers outside of Ur. And of course the very word Babel today means confusion. If you take all of your pages and hours of history, you're dealing with a tale of two cities, Israel and Babylon, spiritual light or conversely spiritual darkness. Everything in this place has a lower level meaning and a higher level meaning. After the Hebrews left Egypt, the land of Osiris, Ra, the eye of Horus, and entered Sinai following the plagues of Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea, the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat between the wings of the two archangels, Placing the Ark inside the Holy of Holies at the very center of the temple where the high priest would go in once a year and he would sprinkle the blood of atonement on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Speaking of power in the blood. I don't understand right. Moses wrote this 2,000 years before Yeshua was born, before Jesus was born and crucified. So you're, when you say God's sacred name, when the high priest was sprinkling blood on the Ark of the Covenant and saying God's holy sacred name, sprinkling blood on the Ark, he would be saying Yahweh, your name of And the word picture is behold the hand, behold the nail. Once a year, in the center of the tabernacle in the heart. That's the unspeakable name of God, by the way. In the Holy of Holies, while putting the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, the high priest sprinkling the blood once a year would be saying, 
Behold the hand, behold the nail. Surrounded by the encampment of all of the Israelite tribes, God gave some very tedious instructions on the setup of this camp in the wilderness with the Levite priests dead in the center, in fact itemizing out what the exact population numbers were of each of the tribes that were camping. Sometimes the most curious things are buried right in plain sight. I saved some time for you. This is what exactly that camp would have looked like. Does the shape of that precisely calculated out layout look familiar? This image here is precisely what the shape of the Israelite camp would have looked like. Of course the Levites and the tabernacle itself were right in the center, the heart right there. And deeper inside that middle, in the heart of the holiest of holies where the priest would stand before the mercy seat itself and say the unspeakable name of God. Behold the hand, behold the nail. This is more than 1500 years before Jesus Christ. It was a moving cross out there on the desert floor. That would have been so mesmerizing to have seen looking down with all the little campfires going from the sky at night. Let's see if we can take that a step deeper. Curiously, if you take the names from Adam all the way down to Noah in the book of Genesis, and you look at the root meaning of those names, this is what it reads. Man appointed mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. You'd have a terrible time convincing me that some Hebrew scribes concocted that in the Genesis text. Nonetheless, let's go deeper than that. Pre-flood, Book of Enoch. He goes further than just fallen angels and hybrid offspring. Enoch is redundantly prophesying the coming of this Son of Man, laying out that at a time in the future, not only will what has been done be undone, but further, that through his name they shall be saved. There are at least 365 extremely specific prophecies of the coming of that child and the sacrifice of a savior. The Passover began before the final plague in Egypt before the Israelite slaves marched out of the largest empire on earth, fulfilling every single rule of a Passover sacrifice, no less. And before the final plague of Egypt, they were to put the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorpost. Curious what meanings can be found in things when you're willing to scratch. One curious detail, the symbol of the Tav during any Canaanite or pre-Canaanite time period would have looked something like this. It is true that the ancient Tav, meaning sign or mark, perhaps covenant, looks something exactly like this. Crucifixion would not even become a practice until five ages of empires later under the Romans. It is interesting that the blood would be saving their firstborn sons when God would be giving up his. In fact, even done on Passover day. While the kings of earth were throwing babies onto open fire pits and flames, sparing no expense to build the grandest of towers and ziggurats to feed darkness 
their subjects' lives, to satisfy and appease the unending thirst of their little bitty otherworldly underworld gods. Something tells me that in a minute here, the underworld gods and the shadow people are going to have a role to play in all this before we get to the end. What greater love could one have than to lay down their life for their friends? Here's the empty tomb where Jesus was for three days. That 365 specific prophecies about Jesus Christ by no means includes the fabric of patterns. There are at least four times that many for the second coming. The hours when all the old scorecards get tallied up than there are for the first. Restoration and the entrance and return of the king. But out of all of those prophecies, there's only one other person other than Enoch who used this term, son of man. That would have been Daniel who survived the lion's den, while in the very heart of Babylon, no less. It's astounding how these things work out. It was Daniel who interpreted the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, of the five empires leading to the end, including Nebuchadnezzar's own, and not including the two before it. That makes a total of seven. wonder if that means anything. But an angel would appear in the later years of Daniel's life. More specifically, Gabriel, the same angel that came to Mary prior to the birth of Jesus Christ, as well as believed to be an angel at the tomb after the resurrection. And not only give him a tit for tat, sentence by sentence, line for line walkthrough of coming history and we know that none of that precision was done after the fact because the Septuagint which included Daniel was put together under Ptolemy during the third century BC as is seen in Daniel 11 beginning with the kings of the north and the kings of the south the Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires, predicting even the unlikely rise of the little known underdog, which would later come to be known as the Empire of Rome. Those are some really impressive guesses, but by far the most impressive of the entire bunch is that Daniel would predict the exact day and date that Jesus Christ would enter the front gate of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah 9.9 that the people rejoice as the king cometh on the back of a foul donkey. This would be the 10th of Nisan, or more precisely, April 6th, 32 AD four days before the crucifixion. Daniel is giving you the exact starting point. Daniel 9.25 states, Know and understand this, from the time that the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the king comes. The date that a Persian king gave the decree of Artaxerxes on March 14th, 445 BC to restore and rebuild Jerusalem after the Persians had defeated Babylon in exactly the way by exactly the guy, Cyrus, that Isaiah had predicted 200 years in advance. Countdown leading to the precise day and writing this more than 500 years in advance. It brings new meaning to when Jesus Christ told the Pharisees, you think that in those scriptures 
you have eternal life, but it's those very pages that speak of me. Because of the mass reports of healings and blind eyes open on many occasions, the masses had wanted to make him king, but he never allowed them to praise him and declare him out as king until one very particular day that Daniel had given the math for more than 500 years in advance. Arriving at the front gate of Jerusalem, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, told Jesus, you have to shut these people up. This is heresy. Jesus replied to the Pharisees, if I were to silence these people, indeed I tell you, even the rocks of this place would cry out. If you do the math from the decree of Artaxerxes to the triumphant entry, this point here, 69 times 7 times 360, using the identical calendar system of the ancient world, most especially Babylon, making provision for the 24-day difference between March 14th and April 6th, as well as your 116 days added in for leap years, you're going to come up to exactly 173,880 days. On the money, Daniel's margin of error. More than 500 years beforehand from that angel's lips was precisely zero. But if I hop backwards much before Daniel, before even the young King David stamped into the pages of history for the highly unusual, miraculous defeat of a six-fingered giant named Goliath. But going back past even David, the one often called a man after God's own heart, beyond the days in the wilderness, then even the time in Egypt, back to our first little starting gate cultures down here in Egypt and over here in Samaria, the place of ancient Uruk, where Gilgamesh depicted here his statue ruled. Right here to the land and area of Ur. Now that is a giant holding a lion, right? Where Abraham the father of all the future children of Israel was living. Many believe that Abraham could see the base of the Tower of Babel while growing up. And then it begins a little something like this. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show unto thee. Abraham would ultimately travel over here to exactly where modern day Jerusalem is. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. That's a very big promise. One night he woke up with hot sweats and horrors that the Lord had shown him that his descendants would be slaves in a foreign land for 400 years, but that God himself said that he would judge that nation. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. What those pages are telling you is that the Hebrews, Israel, was the delivery system for the Savior of all mankind leading full circle to the most well-known passage 
in the whole masquerade of particles that makes up the planet Earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting and eternal life. And every single possible thing, short of the kitchen sink, tried to stand in the way of that. What those pages are saying, all of them, is that you, no matter who you are on the other side of the screen, were born above even the angels. Someone asked me the other day how I truly thought that the entire universe was held together. I was stumped by the question. Here's my answer. It's love. Totally undeserved love. Never listen to snakes because they're snakes. You were born to be free in every possible sense in both this life and the next. It's my extremely strong opinion that the shadow people are not your friends. Go on your own journey to ask these very same questions. Your life is worth that. Oh, before I forget, Jesus did say another thing to his disciples. In Matthew 24 it says, So it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be in the day of the return of the Son of Man. One can only wonder what exactly that might mean. It is true that the grand finale of any fireworks show is always at the end. I'm Trey Smith, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Here's some fireworks for you of the friendly kind. Look at how that skull actually does have an enormous skull cap on the back, that it is genetically different in its bone structure than a human skull. It's not just that the head is longer, it's actually got a different structure. Coming this winter, soon, or maybe even available now. Depending on when you're watching this video. All the Nephilim video you just watched on DVD in high quality with over 45 minutes of extra commentary with Trey Smith on Nephilim, Aliens, Demons, and the Coming Future. A DVD you won't want to miss. We are not responsible for any Nephilim which may have been injured in the making of this video. Special thanks to Michael Donner as well as Trevor Demere for the music that you heard composed in this video, as well as Brian Forrester for providing the video footage of the elongated skulls that you saw inside the Nephilim video, as well as to Rabbi Brian Hall who provided much more information than was possibly covered in the few clips where he was talking, as well as Rick Hummer. And also the largest dedication of the entire video to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, without whom this video would not have been possible at all had I not been able to hit my knees every single morning and talk to him before I started doing any one of these clips. You just watched The Nephilim by The God in a Nutshell Project. Stay tuned, I've got a few more things tucked into the back of the video for you. Click the subscribe button, it's found right down here on your YouTube screen. There's a lot more to come. So make sure you subscribe to this channel, but more than that, if you go over to The God in a Nutshell Project, that's godinanutshell.com, 
video The Theory of Everything, which looks something exactly like that, is out and available. The video is about three hours long, a little less than that. It's also free to watch on YouTube. See, there I am right there in a slightly lower quality than the DVD. Special thanks, by the way, to everyone that gets a copy of the DVD Theory of Everything. You can find out more about that DVD that's on the screen right there at GodInTheNutshell.com or, and also, the coming release of the Nephilim video that you just watched with some extended content inside the video, as well as some other videos that we've got on the burner to kick out here in the shortly coming future. Also, if you're someone who enjoys to write or blog or post news articles online, come over to GodInTheNutshell.com. We're looking for writers and bloggers, so come on over to the website and post a submission to become a writer on GodInTheNutshell.com. And I am the author of Thieves, One Dirty TV Pastor and the Man Who Robbed Him. This is a true story. In 1999, when I was a stupid kid, I committed a safe robbery on a television pastor named Mike Murdoch. This is an article done by D Magazine about the book. That's me down there running from Mike Murdoch with the safe on my back. This is Mike with his standard goatee up there coming through there. To me, it all sort of feels like it happened in a different life at this point through the television screen. He looks a little bit uh, angry in that uh, picture there. But if you're curious what could happen to a man's mind that would drive him to commit a safe robbery on a television pastor and then end up in the desert of Mexico, you're in luck. Here's some clips. Thieves by Trey Smith. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere books are sold. I've been on radio and TV for 20 years. And Trey, first, as far as the book itself, I'll give you an example. My producer, Will Duffy, his wife, Danielle, was in the hospital to give birth. And they had some time. So Will is reading aloud Thieves. And not only his wife becomes addicted to it, but people in neighboring beds, neighboring rooms, all sat in to listen to Thieves being read. It's like Danielle wanted to delay labor because she was so fascinated. Thieves was me pouring literally my heart out day after day. These were all written in a jail cell. And guards used to pay me when they were on shift. They would give me extra lunch trays to read them this book. So Thieves was originally paid for with jailhouse lunch trays. And then, after the safe robbery, when I'm on the run from a television pastor in Mexico, it really kicks into high octane. Sometimes I would just stop and say to myself, there's not a lot of really great ways for any of this to end. Crazy as it seems, though, it did all end well. I promise. Thank God for that. I'm pretty certain that you're not going to find anything like this. Anywhere. I wanted to tack a note onto the end of this video and state to you that that book, Thieves, from start to finish, no matter how fun it might be to read, does not in any way represent who I am today. And more than that, I've not only asked forgiveness in my own heart, but from a great many parties uh, who are in that book and who are not in that book that I needed to ask for forgiveness from. More than that, I'd like to give a special thank you to ministries, men and women of faith, churches and organizations all across this United States because they are not represented. The hearts of the people are not represented by the few that are just take, 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 take. I have seen so many, both great and small ministries, who no matter who they are, they would give you the last shirt off of their back. And I want to thank them. I'm Trey Smith. God bless every one of you.